Walden by Henry David Thoreau. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Chapter Six Visitors. I think that I love society as much as most, and am ready enough to fasten myself like a bloodsucker for the time to any full blooded man that comes in my way. I am naturally no hermit, but might possibly sit out the sturdiest frequenter of the bar room if my business called me thither. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, three for society. When visitors came in larger and unexpected numbers, there was but the third chair for them all, but they generally economized the room by standing up. It is surprising how many great men and women a small house will contain. I have had twenty-five or thirty souls, with their bodies at once under my roof, and yet we often parted without being aware that we had come very near to one another. Many of our houses, both public and private, with their almost innumerable apartments, their huge halls and their cellars for the storage of wines and other munitions of peace, appear to be extravagantly large for their inhabitants. They are so vast and magnificent that the latter seem to be only vermin which infest them. I am surprised when the herald blows his summons before some Tremont or Astor or Middlesex house to see come creeping out over the piazza for all inhabitants a ridiculous mouse, which soon again slinks into some hole in the pavement. One inconvenience I sometimes experienced in so small a house, the difficulty of getting to a sufficient distance from my guest when we began to utter the big thoughts in big words. You want room for your thoughts to get into sailing trim and run a course or two before they make their port. The bullet of your thought must have overcome its lateral and ricochet motion and fallen into its last and steady course before it reaches the ear of the hearer, else it may plough out again through the side of his head. Also our sentences wanted room to unfold and form their columns in the interval. Individuals, like nations, must have suitable broad and natural boundaries, even a considerable neutral ground between them. I have found it a singular luxury to talk across the pond to a companion on the opposite side. In my house we were so near that we could not begin to hear, we could not speak low enough uh, to be heard. As when you throw two stones into calm water so near that they break each other's undulations. If we are merely loquacious and loud talkers, then we can afford to stand very near together, cheek by jowl, and feel each other's breath. But if we speak reservedly and thoughtfully, we must be farther apart, that all animal heat and moisture may have a chance to evaporate. If we would enjoy the most intimate society with that in each of us which is without, or above, being spoken to, we must not only be silent, but commonly so far apart bodily that we cannot possibly hear each other's voice in any case. Referred to this standard, a speech is for the convenience of those who are hard of hearing, but there are many fine things which we cannot say if we have to shout. As the conversation began to assume a loftier and grander tone, we gradually shoved our chairs farther apart till they touched the wall in opposite corners, and then commonly there was not room enough. My best room, however, my withdrawing room, always ready for company, on whose carpet the sun rarely fell, was the pine wood behind my house. Thither in summer days, when distinguished guests came, I took them, and a priceless domestic swept the floor and dusted the furniture and kept the things in order. If one guest came, he sometimes partook of my frugal meal, and it was no interruption to conversation to be stirring a hasty pudding or watching the rising and maturing of a loaf of bread in the ashes in the meanwhile. But if twenty came and sat in my house, there was nothing said about dinner." though there might be bread enough for two, more than if eating were a forsaken habit. 
but we naturally practiced abstinence, and this was never felt to be an offense against hospitality, but the most proper and considerate course. The waste and decay of physical life which so often needs repair seemed miraculously retarded in such a case, and the vital vigor stood its ground. I could entertain thus a thousand as well as twenty, and if any ever went away disappointed or hungry from my house when they found me at home, they may depend upon it that I sympathized with them at least. So easy is it, though many housekeepers doubt it, to establish new and better customs in the place of the old. You need not rest your reputation on the dinners you give. For my own part, I was never so effectually deterred from frequenting a man's house by any kind of Cerberus whatever as by the parade one made about dining me, which I took to be a very polite and roundabout hint never to trouble him so again. I think I shall never revisit those scenes. I should be proud to have, for the motto of my cabin, those lines of Spencer which one of my visitors inscribed on a yellow walnut leaf for a card. Arrived there, the little house they fill. Ne look for entertainment where none was. Rest is their feast, and all things at their will. The noblest mind the best contentment has. When Winslow, afterward governor of the Plymouth Colony, went with a companion on a visit of ceremony to Massasoit on foot through the woods, and arrived tired and hungry at his lodge, they were well received by the king, but nothing was said about eating that day. When the knight arrived, to quote their own words, he laid us on the bed with himself and his wife, they at the one end and we at the other, it being only planks, laid a foot from the ground and a thin mat upon them. Two more of his chief men, for want of room, pressed by and upon us, so that we were worse weary of our lodging than of our journey. At one o'clock the next day Massasoit brought two fishes that he had shot, about thrice as big as a bream. These being boiled, there were at least forty looked for a share in them, the most eat of them. This meal only we had in two nights and a day, and had not one of us brought a partridge, we had taken our journey fasting. Fearing that they would be light-headed for want of food and also sleep, owing to the savages' barbarous singing, for they used to sing themselves to sleep, and that they might get home while they had strength to travel, they departed. As for lodging, it is true they were but poorly entertained, though what they found an inconvenience was no doubt intended for an honor. But as far as eating was concerned, I do not see how the Indians could have done better. They had nothing to eat themselves, and they were wiser than to think that apologies could supply the place of food to their guests. So they drew their belts tighter and said nothing about it. Another time, when Winslow visited them, it being a season of plenty with them, there was no deficiency in this respect. As for men, they will hardly fail one anywhere. I had more visitors while I lived in the woods than at any other period in my life. I mean that I had some. I met several there under more favorable circumstances than I could anywhere else. But fewer came to see me on trivial business, in this respect my company was winnowed by my mere distance from town. I had withdrawn so far within the great ocean of solitude, into which the rivers of society empty, that for the most part, so far as my needs were concerned, only the finest sediment was deposited around me. Beside, there were wafted to me evidences of unexplored and uncultivated continents on the other side. Who should come to my lodge this morning but a true Homeric or Paphlagonian man? He had so suitable and poetic a name that I am sorry I cannot print it here. A Canadian, a woodchopper and postmaker, 
who can hole fifty posts in a day, who made his last supper on a woodchuck which his dog caught. He too has heard of Homer, and, if it were not for books, would not know what to do rainy days, though perhaps he has not read one wholly through for many rainy seasons. Some priest who could pronounce the Greek itself taught him to read his verse in the testament in his native parish far away, and now I must translate to him while he holds the book Achilles' reproof to Patroclus for his sad countenance. Why are you in tears, Patroclus, like a young girl, or have you alone heard some news from Pythia? They say that Minutius lives yet son of Actor, and Peleus lives son of Achus, among the Myrmidons, either of whom, having died, we should greatly grieve. He says, that's good. He has a great bundle of white oak bark under his arm for a sick man gathered this Sunday morning. I suppose there's no harm in going after such a thing today, says he. To him Homer was a great writer, though what his writing was about he did not know. A more simple and natural man it would be hard to find. Vice and disease, which cast such a somber moral hue over the world, seem to have hardly any existence for him. He was about twenty-eight years old, and had left Canada and his father's house a dozen years before to work in the States, and earn money to buy a farm with that last, perhaps in his native country. He was cast in the coarsest mould, a stout but sluggish body, yet gracefully carried, with a thick sun-burnt neck, dark bushy hair, and dull, sleepy blue eyes, which were occasionally lit up with expression. He wore a flat gray cloth cap, a dingy wool-colored greatcoat, and cowhide boots. He was a great consumer of meat, usually carrying his dinner to his work a couple of miles past my house, for he chopped all summer, in a tin pail, cold meats, often cold woodchucks, and coffee in a stone bottle which dangled by a string from his belt, and sometimes he offered me a drink. He came along early, crossing my bean-field, though without anxiety or haste to get to his work, such as Yankees exhibit. He wasn't a-going to hurt himself. He didn't care if he only earned his board. Frequently he would leave his dinner in the bushes, when his dog had caught a woodchuck by the way, and go back a mile and a half to dress it and leave it in the cellar of the house where he boarded, after deliberating first for half an hour whether he could not sink it in the pond safely till nightfall. Loving to dwell long upon these themes, he would say as he went by in the morning, How thick the pigeons are! If working every day were not my trade, I could get all the meat I should want by hunting pigeons, woodchucks, rabbits, partridges. By gosh, I could get all I should want for a week in one day. He was a skillful chopper, and indulged in some flourishes and ornaments in his art. He cut his trees level and close to the ground, that the sprouts which came up afterward might be more vigorous, and a sled might slide over the stumps, and instead of leaving a whole tree to support his corded wood, he would pare it away to a slender stake or splinter, which you could break off with your hand at last. He interested me because he was so quiet and solitary and so happy withal, a well of good humor and contentment which overflowed at his eyes. His mirth was without alloy. Sometimes I saw him at his work in the woods, felling trees, and he would greet me with a laugh of inexpressible satisfaction and a salutation in Canadian French, though he spoke English as well. When I approached him he would suspend his work, and with half-suppressed mirth lie along the trunk of a pine which he had felled, and peeling off the inner bark, roll it up into a ball, and chew it while he laughed and talked. Such an exuberance of animal spirits had he, that he sometimes tumbled down and rolled on the ground with laughter at anything which made him think and tickled him, 
Looking round upon the trees, he would exclaim, "'By George, I can enjoy myself well enough here chopping. I want no better sport.' Sometimes, when at leisure, he amused himself all day in the woods with a pocket pistol, firing salutes to himself at regular intervals as he walked. In the winter he had a fire by which at noon he warmed his coffee in a kettle, and as he sat on a log to eat his dinner, the chickadees would sometimes come round and alight on his arm and peck at the potato in his fingers, and he said that he liked to have the little fellers about him. In him the animal man chiefly was developed. In physical endurance and contentment he was cousin to the pine and the rock. I asked him once if he was not sometimes tired at night, after working all day. And he answered with a sincere and serious look, Gore a pit! I never was tired in my life. But the intellectual and what is called spiritual man in him were slumbering, as in an infant. He had been instructed only in that innocent and ineffectual way in which the Catholic priests teach the aborigines, by which the pupil is never educated to the degree of consciousness, but only to the degree of trust and reverence, and a child is not made a man, but kept a child. When nature made him, she gave him a strong body, and contentment for his portion, and propped him on every side with reverence and reliance, that he might live out his threescore years and ten a child. He was so genuine and unsophisticated that no introduction would serve to introduce him, more than if you introduced a woodchuck to your neighbor. He had got to find him out as you did. He would not play any part. Men paid him wages for work, and so helped to feed and clothe him, but he never exchanged opinions with them. He was so simply and naturally humble, if he can be called humble who never aspires, that humility was no distinct quality in him, nor could he conceive of it. Wiser men were demigods to him. If you told him that such a one was coming, he did as if he thought that anything so grand would expect nothing of himself but take all the responsibility on itself and let him be forgotten still. He never heard the sound of praise. He particularly reverenced the writer and the preacher. Their performances were miracles. When I told him that I wrote considerably, he thought for a long time that it was merely the handwriting which I meant, for he could write a remarkably good hand himself. I sometimes found the name of his native parish handsomely written in the snow by the highway, with the proper French accent, and knew that he had passed. I asked him if he ever wished to write his thoughts. He said that he had read and written letters for those who could not, but he never tried to write thoughts. No, he could not. He could not tell what to put first. It would kill him, and then there was spelling to be attended to at the same time. I heard that a distinguished wise man and reformer asked him if he did not want the world to be changed, but he answered with a chuckle of surprise in his Canadian accent, not knowing that the question had ever been entertained before. Mm. No, I like it well enough. It would have suggested many things to a philosopher to have dealings with him. To a stranger he appeared to know nothing of things in general, yet I sometimes saw in him a man whom I had not seen before, and I did not know whether he was as wise as Shakespeare or as simply ignorant as a child, whether to suspect him of a fine poetic consciousness or of stupidity. A townsman told me that when he met him sauntering through the village in his small, close-fitting cap and whistling to himself, he reminded him of a prince in disguise. His only books were an almanac and an arithmetic, in which last he was considerably expert. The former was a sort of cyclopedia to him, which he supposed to contain an abstract of human knowledge as indeed it does to a considerable extent. 
I loved to sound him on the various reforms of the day, and he never failed to look at them in the most simple and practical light. He had never heard of such things before. Could he do without factories, I asked? He had worn the home-made Vermont gray, he said, and that was good. Could he dispense with tea and coffee? Does this country afford any beverage beside water? He had soaked hemlock leaves in water and drank it, and thought that was better than water in warm weather. When I asked him if he could do without money, he showed the convenience of money in such a way as to suggest and coincide with the most philosophical accounts of the origin of this institution, and the very derivation of the word pecunia. If an ox were his property, and he wished to get needles and thread at the store, he thought it would be inconvenient and impossible soon to go on mortgaging some portion of the creature each time to that amount. He could defend many institutions better than any philosopher, because in describing them as they concerned him he gave the true reason for their prevalence, and speculation had not suggested to him any other. At another time, hearing Plato's definition of a man, a biped without feathers, and that one exhibited a cock plucked and called it Plato's man, he thought it an important difference that the knees bent the wrong way. He would sometimes exclaim, How I love to talk! By George, I could talk all day! I asked him once, when I had not seen him for many months, if he had got a new idea this summer. "'Good Lord,' said he, "'a man that has to work as I do, "'if he does not forget the ideas he has had, "'he will do well. "'Maybe the man you hoe with is inclined to race. "'Then, by gorry, your mind must be there. "'You think of weeds.' "'He would sometimes ask me first on such occasions "'if I had made any improvement.' One winter day I asked him if he was always satisfied with himself, wishing to suggest a substitute within him for the priest without, and some higher motive for living. "'Satisfied,' said he. "'Some men are satisfied with one thing, and some with another. One man, perhaps, if he has got enough, will be satisfied to sit all day with his back to the fire and his belly to the table. By George!' Yet I never, by any manoeuvring, could get him to take the spiritual view of things. The highest that he appeared to conceive of was a simple expediency, such as you might expect an animal to appreciate. And this, practically, is true of most men. If I suggested any improvement in his mode of life, he merely answered, without expressing any regret, that it was too late. Yet he thoroughly believed in honesty and the like virtues. There was a certain positive originality, however slight, to be detected in him, and I occasionally observed that he was thinking for himself and expressing his own opinion, a phenomenon so rare that I would any day walk ten miles to observe it, and it amounted to the re-origination of many of the institutions of society. Though he hesitated, and perhaps failed to express himself distinctly, he always had a presentable thought behind. Yet his thinking was so primitive, and immersed in his animal life, that, though more promising than a merely learned man's, it rarely ripened to anything which can be reported. He suggested that there might be men of genius in the lowest grades of life, however permanently humble and illiterate, who take their own view always, or do not pretend to see at all, who are as bottomless even as Walden Pond was thought to be, though they may be dark and muddy. Many a traveller came out of his way to see me, in the inside of my house, and as an excuse for calling asked for a glass of water. I told them that I drank at the pond, and pointed thither, offering to lend them a dipper. Far off as I lived, I was not exempted from the annual visitation which occurs, methinks, about the first of April, when everybody is on the move, 
and I had my share of good luck, though there were some curious specimens among my visitors. Half-witted men from the almshouse and elsewhere came to see me, but I endeavored to make them exercise all the wit they had and make their confessions to me, in such case making wit the theme of our conversation, and so was compensated. Indeed, I found some of them to be wiser than the so-called overseers of the poor and select men of the town, and thought it was time that the tables were turned. With respect to wit, I learned that there was not much difference between the half and the whole. One day in particular, an inoffensive, simple-minded pauper, whom with others I had often seen used as fencing stuff, standing or sitting on a bushel in the fields to keep cattle and himself from straying, visited me and expressed a wish to live as I did. He told me, with the utmost simplicity and truth, quite superior, or rather inferior, to anything that is called humility, that he was deficient in intellect. These were his words. The Lord had made him so, yet he supposed the Lord cared as much for him as for another. I have always been so, said he, from my childhood. I never had much mind. I was not like other children. I am weak in the head. It was the Lord's will, I suppose. And there he was to prove the truth of his words. He was a metaphysical puzzle to me. I have rarely met a fellow man on such promising ground. It was so simple and sincere and so true all that he said, and true enough in proportion as he appeared to humble himself, was he exalted. I did not know at first, but it was the result of a wise policy. It seemed that from such a basis of truth and frankness as the poor weak-headed pauper had laid, our intercourse might go forward to something better than the intercourse of sages. I had some guests from those not reckoned commonly among the town's poor, but who should be, who are among the world's poor. At any rate, guests who appeal not to your hospitality, but to your hospitality, who earnestly wish to be helped and preface their appeal with the information that they are resolved, for one thing, never to help themselves. I require of a visitor that he be not actually starving, though he may have the very best appetite in the world, however he got it. Objects of charity are not guests. Men who did not know when their visit had terminated, though I went about my business again, answering them from greater and greater remoteness. Men of almost every degree of wit called on me in the migrating season, some who had more wits than they knew what to do with, runaway slaves with plantation manners, who listened from time to time like the fox in the fable, as if they heard the hounds obeying on their track, and looked at me beseechingly as much as to say, O oh, Christian, Will you send me back? One real runaway slave, among the rest, whom I helped to forward toward the North Star, men of one idea, like a hen with one chicken, and that a duckling, men of a thousand ideas, and unkempt heads, like those hens which are made to take charge of a hundred chickens, all in pursuit of one bug, a score of them lost in every morning's dew, and become frizzled and mangy in consequence. Men of ideas instead of legs, a sort of intellectual centipede that made you crawl all over. One man proposed a book in which visitors should write their names, as at the White Mountains, but, alas, I have too good a memory to make that necessary." I could not but notice some of the peculiarities of my visitors. Girls and boys and young women generally seemed glad to be in the woods. They looked in the pond and at the flowers and improved their time. 
Men of business, even farmers, thought only of solitude and employment, and of great distance at which I dwelt from something or other, and though they said that they loved a ramble in the woods occasionally, it was obvious that they did not. Restless, committed men whose time was taken up in getting a living or keeping it, ministers who spoke of God as if they enjoyed a monopoly of the subject, who could not bear all kinds of opinions, doctors, lawyers, uneasy housekeepers who pried into my cupboard and bed when I was out. How came Mrs. to know that my sheets were not as clean as hers? Young men who had ceased to be young, and had concluded that it was safest to follow the beaten track of the professions, all these generally said that it was not possible to do so much good in my position. Ay, there was the rub. The old and infirm and the timid, of whatever age or sex, thought most of sickness, and sudden accident and death. To them life seemed full of danger. What danger is there if you don't think of any? and they thought that a prudent man would carefully select the safest position where Dr. B. might be on hand at a moment's warning. To them the village was literally a community, a league for mutual defense, and you would suppose that they would not go a huckleberrying without a medicine chest. The amount of it is, if a man is alive, there is always danger that he may die though the danger must be allowed to be less in proportion as he is dead and alive to begin with. A man sits as many risks as he runs. Finally, there were the self-styled reformers, the greatest bores of all, who thought that I was forever singing, This is the house that I built, this is the man that lives in the house that I built but they did not know that the third line was, These are the folks that worry the man that lives in the house that I built. I did not fear the hen harriers, for I kept no chickens, but I feared the men harriers, rather. I had more cheering visitors than the last, children come a-burying, railroad men taking a Sunday morning walk in clean shirts, fishermen and hunters, poets and philosophers, in short, all honest pilgrims, who came out to the woods for freedom's sake, and really left the village behind, I was ready to greet with. Welcome, Englishmen, welcome, Englishmen, for I had had communication with that race. End of chapter 6